broken only by the ripples made by a family of passing ducks, reflect the dawning of a new day in the fertile irrigated cotton areas of Australia. Here, great machines invade the earth wielding barbed spindles, which pick the cotton from the bowls as they move up and down the endless rows of plants. Cotton has been grown in Australia for over 100 years. But in the past, due to unreliable rainfall, poor yields were produced. Since the early 1960s, however, controlled irrigation, technological advances in cotton growing machinery, chemicals for insect and weed control, along with improved cultural practices and better varieties have led to a tremendous advancement in cotton growing in Queensland and New South Wales. of the many cotton growers of Australia has made cotton the white gold of Australia. This is their story. Cotton is essentially a deep-rooted plant and prefers a soil permitting growth to a depth of 1.5 meters. It is adaptable to soil types ranging from heavy clay to light sandy loam. Growers prepare the earth by plowing to a depth of 33 centimeters. Land is well worked before planting, and with this great machine, nitrogen fertilizer is applied during the preparation. shaped into rows of small beds one meter apart. These deep furrows carry the irrigation water to the plants. This machine plants the seed 50 to 100 millimeters apart. Planting usually takes place in October when the danger of frost is over. Each farm has a main irrigation channel to carry water to smaller field channels. When the cotton seed has been planted and irrigated, the seeds start to germinate. So that the water can flow into the fields, it is siphoned over the banks from the channels by 10 centimetre pipes, which distribute the water to the furrows. Each irrigation supplies the equivalent of 150 millimetres of rain. runs the complete length of the furrows until it reaches the runoff or tail water area at the lower end of the field. This water is then pumped back into the main channel and recycled. The cotton plant is a variety of hibiscus which flowers about 70 days after planting. The flower is yellow for the first day but then changes to a red color. At the bottom of the flower a cotton bowl forms and when this is mature bursts open exposing the dry seed cotton. The young plants are susceptible to attack by insects and other pests, such as the Heliothus bulbworm. Great care is demanded of the farmer throughout the growing season, and the main weapon is the use of insecticide sprays. Before loading, the pilot checks the small propellers along the span of the wings, which will fan out the chemicals over the cotton plants. The spray planes are loaded with chemicals from a highly sophisticated piece of equipment, like this one, on the airstrip of a cotton farm. These chemicals are used to control Heliopus and rough bollworm.
we blow, leaving their trails of chemicals over the cotton plants during the growing period. And continue up until picking time in April. life abounds in the trees on the Country Club golf course, where on weekends, the growers and the cotton industry employees share a round of golf and swap a yarn or two. Whether it's a drink in the clubhouse bar or at the local pub in Weewar, one of the growing areas, the talk always turns to cotton. Paul Carl, one of the American pioneer cotton growers, together with others, was responsible for the establishment of the cotton growing industry in New South Wales. At Mile Vale Research Station near Narrabri, the CSIRO and New South Wales Department of Agriculture have combined to conduct important research work into insect control and resistance. Australian cotton growers contribute generously to research and fund many projects which are starting to show fruitful results. Plant breeding and agronomy are also important aspects of research and glasshouse control allows a constant monitoring of disease and insect resistant plants. Stretching to the horizon, a sea of yellow flowers strain upwards to catch the sun. Sunflower seeds are also grown in the cotton areas and are in demand because the oil has a high percentage of polyunsaturated fats. By late May, the cotton is ready for picking. It's been almost seven months since the seeds were planted. The plant flowered for a period of 60 days and gave way to the cotton bowl, which grew to the size of a small egg. And now the cotton bowls have burst open and the fields, from the air, look as though they are covered by a light sprinkling of snow. A great army of mechanical pickers straddled the rows of cotton, moving slowly, but rhythmically, up and down each one. Barbed spindles rotating inside pick the cotton from the bowl, which is blown into a one-ton capacity storage bin at the rear of the picker. about three and a half meters high, and the operator sits in an elevated position at the front of the machine. When the storage bin is full, it is emptied into cotton trailers strategically placed on access roads in the fields. To ensure the highest possible grade of crop, the plants are defoliated by aerial spraying. Removing the leaves reduces green leaf staining of the cotton and cuts down the accumulation of the waste products of the stalks, dust and leaves. aim to harvest the bulk of the crop, 75 to 90 percent, in the first picking. The bowls that were not ripe enough will open after three or four weeks and then can be harvested during the second pick. Each trailer holds about six tons of seed cotton and when full they are towed to the nearby gins. docket is completed with the necessary information and attached to the load before the trailer is assigned to a position in the yard. 
This information is then passed on to the head chinner and eventually reaches the computer which records and stores all information concerning the particular grower's cotton. When the cotton is ready to gin, the trailers in the yard are towed to the suction bay. At this gin, the cotton can be unloaded from either end of the building. The suction operators walking on the cotton move these large suction pipes back and forth to suck the cotton from the trailers and into the drying compartments. Seed is passed from the dryer to the cleaning machines where foreign matter is removed. The primary function of the ginning process is to separate the fibre or lint from the cotton seed and foreign matter and to comb the fibres into parallel lines by means of a series of saws and brushes which are contained in the machine. The ginner and his two assistants are staff men. The rest of the crew are usually seasonal workers. The leaves and sticks which have been cleaned from the cotton after the initial drying process are conveyed to the furnace for burning. Most of the seeds separated from the cotton during ginning is loaded into trucks and transported to the Northwest Vegetable Oils plant at Narrabri. Soya beans, sunflower and safflower seeds are also processed here. The cotton seed is treated to remove the fine lint that could not be removed in the gin. The seed is processed into edible oil and high protein stock feed. Meanwhile at cotton seed distributors in Weewar, continual testing and experimentation of specially selected seeds delivered from the gin continues throughout the year. Their job is to ensure constant improvement in the seeds used for planting, so every bag of seeds sold has been subjected to quality control. treated and bagged for planting the following season. The process of separating the cotton from the seed continues at the gin and the cleaned and dried cotton continues its journey to the press. Most of the cotton produced is consumed by Australian spinning mills. pressed under great pressure into bales weighing about 225 kilograms. The weight is then recorded and tagged onto the numbered bale. A sample is taken from each bale and together with a portion of the docket is sent for classing. It takes 675 kilograms of unprocessed seed cotton to make one 225 kilogram bale. During the picking season, the gin operates 24 hours a day. It's Saturday night, and for those not rostered on evening shift, it's off to the pub or the local dance for a quiet night away from the noise of machines. of the Namoy Valley have helped build a very modern church at Weewar, attracting many of the local townspeople and their families from many foreign countries to Sunday services. Afterwards, water skiing, Weewar style. No skis, no speedboat, only a motor vehicle and conventional surfboards to make this exciting experience possible along the one-mile irrigation storage dam on the Kajua property. The 
reward is fine, but the aroma of delicious filet mignon steak sizzling on an open fire is too much to resist. For the kids, there's fishing too. Sunday afternoon under the cooler bar trees with good friends and good food. John Howes, general manager of the local cotton cooperative, is very pleased with his culinary achievements in cooking the yellow belly fish caught in the nearby river. Fried tomatoes a la Jim Prendergast are his specialty on picnics. But during the week, Jim's responsible for the cotton classing procedures. The cotton samples taken from the bales of the gins have now reached the classing rooms where girls test the samples for micron air. This involves weighing exactly 50 grams of cotton on these delicate scales. This sample is then placed in the Micron Air machine, which measures the fineness or coarseness of the fibre. After 24 hours in the humidification room, the samples are ready to be classed for colour, leaf content, preparation and staple length when the fibres are pulled apart. Classing under special lighting conforms with universal standards too. Computers are programmed to receive the information from the classing room and Weybridge dockets, the grower's identification, the field picked, time of picking and ginning, type of seed grown, etc. Within 24 hours, the grower receives a report on his production. After classing, the baled cotton is stored in these large storage sheds. The sale of Australian cotton is made against the earlier class samples to the spinning mills in Australia and that portion not required by them is exported to overseas buyers in Japan, Hong Kong, other Asian countries and Europe. From the cotton centres in New South Wales and Queensland, the bales of cotton are transported to Brisbane and Sydney, where they are loaded onto container vessels. Thanks to the determination of the cotton growers of Australia, and the hard work of the many researchers, the cotton sets sail for distant destinations to compete on the world market. And as the buyers know, Australian produced cotton is of world class.